Hey. Hi there. Hi. So thanks for uh, agreeing to do a second conversation. I... Well, yeah, I liked, I had fun the first time. It, it seemed like it flowed really well. And I always liked that. Yeah, so. me too. Me too. And I have a lot of great questions. Uh, I see. I, I copied your one off the email. Let me get this mic a little closer here. Um, yeah. So I've got a few of them and we'll see if we can get to all of them. And if we can, good. And if we can't, maybe, you know, some other time. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. good. All right. So our last conversation was so satisfying that I thought we could give it another go and deepen on the topics that we had already discussed, uh, yeah. as well as put some new topics, uh, new subjects on the table. So one of my first questions is I've realized recently, actually, in my in the people around me that they still don't understand that there's a difference between religion and spirituality. And my huh. guess to that is I think it's because we use the, some of the same vernacular, like the words like divine and spirit or Christ mm -hmm. consciousness. So can you explain what you think the difference between religion and mm -hmm. spirituality is? And at the same time, why practicing one doesn't necessarily have to negate the other? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I think... Um, if I go back a little ways, I think that all religions originated with this desire to understand how life works, how consciousness works, how energy even works, even if they didn't know that's what they were exploring, you know, and, or the seasons and the solstice, you know, how the earth worked, everything. It was like, what's the mystery, you know? And, and so I think that there's a core in every religion that really goes back to a certain nugget of desire and truth. Um, and, and, and over the years, then I think the different cultures had their different ways of seeing things. They have different origin stories, you know, but all kind of come similarly to and describe some, like I said, a, a nugget, a core of something true. But, um, and so of course they evolved differently. And, and, um, and to the point where, I, I don't know when this started, but the priesthoods started to exist. Like this level of people who claim that I'm the intermediary between you and God and the divine. And I'm the one who's gonna interpret this for you or I will get the messages and then tell you about it. You know, maybe they were prophets, maybe they were, um, I don't know, but <laughs> just very egotistical people. I don't know. But uh, but that then I think started to skew things a bit because it, it didn't allow people to have this idea that they have their own direct connection to the divine through their own body, through their own mind, and that they're not separated. And so then that whole idea of separation started coming about. And then because there were these priesthoods, then they had to have laws in the religion of practices that they would do in order to be good people. And, uh, and the, the priesthoods became like parental figures in a way, I think. And in my mind, it's, that distorted things a lot. But also religion, I think, provides a structure for people who are confused and who don't have a sense of things or that the mystery is so huge or the outside world is so big and crazy that how do you make sense of your life? And it serves a good purpose for a certain level of consciousness. And I'm not saying lower or higher or anything good or bad, but there are times when we need some structure. Yeah. You know, and um, so it works for that but and and so i say we go into religion and maybe we do do it for a period of time i mean i myself was a christian minister in my last life you know and really oh yeah and had been in the church for quite a while and then this this lifetime they tried to send me to sunday school and i walked out the back door and hid <laughs> and, and then till came back when they were going to come pick me up because I guess somehow in me, I knew that I didn't want to get in that again. I did it already. So I want to broaden out my view. Um, but anyway, so I think then that spirituality 
is kind of the direct, almost like a mystical connection. And of course, every religion has its mysticism, right? Mm -hmm. Those people who have a direct communion with the saints, that you know, they are saints, or they have a direct communion with the angels and with the divine and with the ascended beings, whatever they, however they describe it, those those entities. Um, and they don't have rules. They have connection. Um, and I think spirituality goes more in that direction. So that it is um, um, something that you yourself go into through, a, whether it's a meditation, um, shamans will go into it through trance or through um, substances like psychedelics, whatever's, you know, um, but, but they'll enter a state of communion with higher states of consciousness. When you do that a lot, and you practice that, you start to understand that there are principles in the non-physical world. There is a non-physical world, mm -hmm. you know, and it operates according to universal laws or principles uh, that are actually quite harmonious and orderly. And um, turn that off. But yeah, and so that that in itself, um, it, you know, it, it teaches you something about really how life works and, um, yeah, there we go. So we won't have noise. Um, <laughs> so um, I think there is spirituality in religion. Mm -hmm. There's not necessarily religion and spirituality. Mm -hmm. I don't know. How does that sit with you? Does that make sense? Or yeah, it makes thoughts sense. about it? There is structure in spirituality or like, like you said, in the laws of the universe and everything mm -hmm. is very harmonious. So it's like I the would... structure is inherent though. It's internal. Yeah, exactly. It's not rules on the outside that if you don't do things this way, you're exactly. a sinner or that this is going to be bad. Um, and there's no punishing parent. There's just that you learn by, if you're in harmony with the way things actually flow and work, things work. Things work. <laughs> and exactly. if you're not in harmony with it, you've missed the mark, you go, that's sinning, right? Missing the mark. Yeah. Then you say, oh, I got a uh, bad feedback. It didn't, didn't go the way I had hoped. Why? Mm -hmm. All right. Now you get yourself realigned and it does work. So you're teaching yourself basically <laughs> through exactly. your own experimentation with, uh, you know, doing things in life. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's what a great answer because it prompted all of my other questions. Awesome. <laughs> um, in personal transformation work, why is raising consciousness paramount? Ah. Uh, well, I think in order for us to transform, what that really means is that we're we're so used to living for many, many eons and lifetimes in the, as soon as we incarnate we come into a body and then we think everything's physical and we see solid objects separated by supposedly empty space and there's distances to cross and it looks like there's a big outside world and all that there's a, a fragmentation that happens when things come into three dimension mm -hmm. and crystallize you know right. they fragment so we have a certain worldview that comes out of just being physical. Mm -hmm. And if you only live in that, then you think all problems are because of physical mm -hmm. causes, all solutions are physical solutions. You know, everything is, um, is so concrete. Mm -hmm. And we, you know, we've lived that way. So many people have lived that way for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. But always in the back of our mind, there's this little thing, but yeah, but that's not all of who I am. Mm -hmm. Oh, we have a soul. Oh, yeah, that, uh, <laughs> you know, but uh, as you something as the frequent, let's call it the frequency on the earth, maybe, you know, it's accelerating and getting higher, then you start to match that a little more, a little more. Uh, and, you know, that has happened gradually over thousands of years I and mean, you know we went from hunter-gatherer societies to uh um, 
the development of the printing press and people became factory workers and you know so there was the industrial age that eventually came up, up and then now the information age where computers came in and then now we're going into another one i call it the intuition, intuition. age but it's been accelerating all the while and as your mind takes on a higher frequency you start to question things like why do I have to just make my living this way? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, maybe I don't have to be in survival. Yeah. Right. And so those are all big shifts and they're not quite exactly what I would call transformation. They are um, growth shifts where consciousness does revise itself and change quite a bit. But what we're up on now is an actual change in the way we perceive reality. Mm -hmm. It's not linear anymore because the frequency has gotten so high uh, that we can't just use our left brains anymore, which is what we've been relying on. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the reptile brain, of course, which is fear, fight or flight stuff, which is very old, right? Mm -hmm. And then the left brain, which is so mental and it makes decisions and definitions about what's safe and what's not safe and what things mean. And then they're going to have to stay that way forever. And we have belief systems now and codes mm -hmm. of conduct and, and, you know, all those rules mm -hmm. that lock down the flow of real genius. Yeah. Um, so, but what's happening now is that it's not like we're, we're trying to raise our consciousness. The frequency is high. We're trying to adjust ourselves to match it. That's what's happening. And as we do, as we embrace it, as we let ourselves um, redefine things or let go of old ideas and uh, our stories and whatever ways that we were uh, limiting our identity, uh, new energy floods in and starts to give us insights in a different way. Now we're starting to move from the left brain into the right brain, into the heart into actually the energy field is conscious. Everything's conscious. Mm -hmm. We're seeing the world not as solid objects anymore, but as everything vibrating at different frequencies in a big sea of frequencies. Mm -hmm. And the non-physical versions of things are right there inside the physical versions of things. They're not separated into heaven and earth. They're all together, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so what transformation and higher consciousness has to do with each other really is that you don't get transformation until you get to a certain level of high frequency which means higher consciousness because they're totally interrelated mm -hmm. right you know you raise your energy your perception goes up you mm -hmm. you drop your energy you start to feel depressed and now you can't see anything anymore you know it's very interconnected so we are starting to understand that life is so fast that it's almost like we don't have a past, present, and future anymore. Those are fragmented ways of seeing the totality. We have one huge present moment. There's no past and there's no future. There are all kinds of potential realities inside our present moment, but at different frequencies. Mm -hmm. So you don't have a future. You have a number of potential realities mm -hmm. that you can choose from, but they're higher frequencies of the one you're in right now. And the past are alternating realities of frequencies that we have done yeah. in this life and maybe many, many other lifetimes. We've gone through all kinds of different frequency realities. And awesome. so now we're getting it that, um, that we pretty much can create the reality through the way we pay attention to things. Mm -hmm. But when things transform, it's going to be very, very fast. I mean, instantaneous healing, all kinds of new stuff coming in and yeah. uh, immediate repercussions to negative thinking or positive thinking because it's all in the moment. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and so that makes things much, much easier and much more fun. You know, and then we get to really have fun being creators. And that's, I think, why we came here onto Earth anyway. Is to Absolutely. Yeah. Play with, with 3D. <laughs> awesome. 
So, Ralph, you, you, you just, you know, ran right into my next question. <laughs> <laughs> Good. So, you know, it's been stated and you also just said it now. And I believe, too, that um, uh, our, our, our state of affairs, meaning our outside reality, is a reflection of our internal landscape. So, and in parallel to this in transparency, you talk about coming here to learn lessons. So my question is, how does someone, you know, start to decipher the interplay uh, about creating their, their reality? What's the meaning of contrasting experiences and how can somebody use those to their benefit? When you say contrasting experiences, what do you mean exactly? Well, challenging experiences, maybe negative experiences, oh. um, mm -hmm. you know, losing a job, uh, right. not being able to be right. financially independent, losing somebody in your life or mm -hmm. anything related to that. Yeah. Well, I think one thing is we, we need to, to understand that everything that happens to us is evolutionary. Mm -hmm. It's always there through the sanity and wisdom of the collective consciousness, which is kind of all souls together, evolving together and helping each other evolve, that it's totally trustworthy. And that's also called the flow, right? So that whatever kind of arises in your space, in your moment, um, is there because you chose to notice it and everybody else is would like you to notice it. <laughs> right? Because... Now, sometimes it's a great insight about a new project or something um, or how life works or something like that, where you're showing and teaching yourself. And other times it's like you said, you lose a job, you you have something sad happen, you get angry and frustrated. And that's important, too, because that shows you where you have a misperception about the truth somewhere down deep or in your past or in, in your subconscious that you haven't quite understood fully yet. And it's coming up so that you can see it and understand it and go into it and see, well, how did that come about? Why do I think that? Or maybe it's not even my idea. I got it from my parents or something. Mm -hmm. um, so everything that comes to you, it's not really contrasting. It's all one thing. Whatever it is, it's like, don't go into the left brain and judge it as being good or bad. It's data, <laughs> you know? It is the, um, it's the next thing you need and the next thing you chose to notice. So I think it helps to put yourself kind of in a responsible position and saying, mm -hmm. hey, I, I'm, I'm gonna notice things even if they're uncomfortable, it's, co it's come up now. So I, I assume it's for a reason. You know, so um, I don't know if that answers your question exactly. Is yes. there another aspect to that? Um, I guess I was looking maybe for um, tips and tricks on how somebody, like, what would be the process of, you know, let's say I lost my job and I understand that this is happening for a reason. Mm -hmm. But what reason is that? Well, that's what you ask yourself. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then you get quiet so that you can open your right brain, which has no language, right? It's just direct experience of everything. You can't access it unless you stop talking mm -hmm. and stop your internal dialogue that's and just point. be. Mm -hmm. Just get super quiet. And out of that quiet, you, and time goes away when you're in that space too. You know, it's like, well, I'll be quiet for five minutes. You know, no, no, <laughs> just, just be purely quiet without any sense of time. And then suddenly some idea, some impression, something will start to just flutter around there. You get a little glimpse or glimmer of it. And there it is surfacing, coming out of that maybe unconscious need to know what's next or to know why did I lose my job? And when you get to that state, then you can ask those questions and you can get a variety of answers, but one certain of them will feel just right. Some of them will feel forced, right? You can get these subtle discriminations of states of being. Yeah. You know, it may be, um, 
you're just done with that chapter. You're, you're done with learning the thing you learned at that job. That you're not working around people of your own vibration and you need to acknowledge that you're all actually at a higher vibration now and you don't fit in there. Mm -hmm. You didn't do anything wrong. It's that you need to find people that are on your wavelength or you need to allow your next talent to arise and blend in with the other things that you just did, you know, or you, you're showing yourself, hey, don't panic. Don't go into negative thinking, stay positive, And guess what? Something will drop in your lap. Yeah. Right. You know, and there are so many kinds of lessons we, we do learn about our consciousness. I have a friend of mine also who made a little video uh, a little while ago, and she was talking about these kinds of triggers or things that happen. And like you said, not to go into panic, even if you don't have the answer right away and to trust that the answer will come. Right. Yeah. Well, it'll come when you get quiet. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's true. It's true you know, because it comes to us right away. But if we don't get quiet, we can't, we can't hear it. We right. And if you're it. saying, well, I don't have the answer yet. Yeah. You know, <laughs> what's wrong? You know, <laughs> That's blocking it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's something wrong with me. Yeah. 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 That you just stall it, stall yeah. things off. Yeah. So what do you think the dividedness of the U.S. election is trying to teach us? Oh, boy. Well, <laughs> um, <laughs> Well, no, I, I think it's a fascinating subject, actually. And I think that um, I go back to this process of transformation again, because I, I need a long view. I need to see the higher view. And then I see why the physical thing is happening the way it was happening. And I think this is not just happening in the US. It's been in smaller ways with maybe less attention on it in other countries and so forth. Um, but we are, the, the world is accelerating and, and the vibration or frequency on the planet is high enough now that old ways of thinking, which are hierarchical, which are ego driven, where you feel separate from everybody else and you, and proud of it, you know, and, uh, yes, and you know, all, there's sort of um, old style thinking, um, power over others, you know, get a lot of money and then I'll get all everything I need, you know, superficial materialistic ways of thinking. They are just steps on, on the stairway to heaven, you know? And so what we're doing now is we're seeing that a lot of those old remedies or um, belief systems are kind of antiquated. They don't actually work. And the, the, in fact, things that are, materialized out of those old belief systems actually kind of fall apart and people suffer. Mm -hmm. So I think we were able to see in this last four years in our country um, that the use of egotistical perception and feeling the separatist thing and that will be great and everybody else leave us alone and, um, and, and, being afraid of people who are different from who you are and you know all, all that kind of thing that's ego based kinds of consciousness and um and it it doesn't have heart true it is is very um polarized you know ego is all about covering over fear yeah and when the fears start to arise which they are now every in everybody's life yeah. um then you you start to feel like it's me against the world, us against them, you know, me against whatever. And I got to, you know, be either dominating and control this whole thing, or I'm a victim. And then I can control things by being a victim and getting other people to do things for me, you know. Yeah. And that is the polarization I think we're feeling a lot in the world right now, because this is the subconscious mind opening and emptying of all the old fears. Well, it's just gonna bat around for a while because everybody's in extreme opposition. Mm -hmm. It's like a ping pong game or something, you know? <laughs> but there are a lot of people who are waking up and moving beyond the bottom line of the triangle, you know, where you have opposition. Yep. To the third point up here, it's like the helicopter view, right? And saying, oh, I see how those two things are interconnected. Ah, they're, you know, they've got the same issue underneath. Yeah. 
And I don't need to participate in either of those positions because there's a higher truth that is based on love or, you know, however, a spiritual reality uh, that has its own very harmonious innate laws. So I'm going to go into that reality and use that as my uh, sounding board. And as you withdraw from the polarized views, um, it takes energy out of those views. Yeah. And as you assume more of this universal view where you're not polarized, it's all about unity, it starts shifting the balance of power, if you will, um, into harmony. And so we had a period where all the subconscious stuff comes up and you see the effects of it and you see what fear can do. And then if, if you're really watching, you say, well, I don't think it works very well that way. So um, let me try this other methodology, you know, and uh, I think people are actually pretty exhausted in yeah. large part, whether they know it or not, by um, being angry and opposed and, and running a lot of adrenaline and being proud and, and, you know, that, that sort of, I'm, you know, it's like, look at my fist, you know, it's, I'm this way. It's a clenching of the whole consciousness of the individuality. There's a need for this softening and relaxing and say, Hey, let things function according to the flow, you know, and start to discover these unifying principles. So I think that um, some of the leaders in the world, I'll say that have are very narcissistic and, autocratic are, it's almost like Hitler, you know, back in the day, somebody had to, to embody these values that would, that were stuck in the subconscious mind that needed to come up and be seen and flushed to the surface and cleared and, and looked at clearly in yeah. the, in the eye. Um, and I think that's what this is all about. Um, I don't think we needed another four years of it in our country. We pretty much got the message and, and the energy corrected itself for now, but we'll see if there are remnants of it. And, but, you know, it's very clearly divided, mm -hmm. you know, and um, so, you know, I, but I have a lot of faith that the universal laws are inside of everything. You know, they always say the truth will out. Well, how can it not? because the universal laws are what it is, yeah. you know, and that inner harmony is the way things actually work when you're separated from it and holding yourself separate from the natural flow. It's exhausting. Mm -hmm. And either you get sick or things start, you know, having trauma in your life or whatever it is, or you die. Yeah. Uh, so it corrects itself one way or another. Yeah. That's perfect. So you've touched upon this. And so it's been confirmed by scientists and physicists and doctors that we're not necessarily victims of our genes and that we right. have the power to heal ourselves, you know, no matter what the ailment is from pancreatic cancer to diabetes and stuff like that. But people mm -hmm. tend to become defensive when you tell them that an illness is psychosomatic. They, they'll say right. things like, well, I don't deserve this, or mm -hmm. my mom had it, so it's in my family genes, I can't right. help it. Or That's another physical explanation. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what do you think and, about that? Yeah. And in even thinking of psychosomatic, it's like, um, I'm mentally ill. No, yeah. I'm not, you know. <laughs> yeah, because no, it's not the like words. that. Yeah, they relate the word psycho to the word crazy. Right. When actually, me it right. means spirit. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Psyche means soul. Yeah. So anyway, um, I think that part of this is just that we haven't really understood that there's a non-physical realm that's inside the physical realm, and that is the soul, and it's all your non-physical stuff like your thought realm, your emotional realm, your energy body. There are things that are not physically seen with the eyes that are giving rise to the physical reality. Mm -hmm. They're like filters that cause the, if you clear fear, you get more love and then your, your reality works better. If you have more fear, you know, you block everything and then you get bad results. It's just, 
because the inside, it's not even reflecting. The outer is a, a materialization, a descendant, a catalytic substance that comes out of the non-physical realm. And depending on what the inner filter is like, that's what the outer world's gonna look like. Because mm -hmm. a certain amount of light gets through and a certain amount of darkness stays, right? Mm -hmm. The more you clear the darkness, the more light gets through. That mm -hmm. changes your reality for the better. Mm -hmm. Simple logic. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and yeah, so we have to understand that the inner reality is a composite of a lot of experiences we've had, not just in this life, but many lifetimes of um, fear and love, some combination of that. And some of those fear places are stuck. And I think that, and we're not aware of these, you know, there it's unconscious, mm -hmm. at least until now, it's mm -hmm. starting to come up now. But, but mainly these things are unconscious and they can create blockages of energy flow, which can create pain, like a stuck shoulder or something, or it can create tumors, or it can create an illness, or can cause an accident. And maybe you break a bone in the area where you need to release energy. Mm -hmm. It's like there's a sanity to all of this. You know, and I was thinking about COVID, you know, that it yeah. really is a thought form that generated this result. And it's a thought form that we have this big outer world that's so huge and, and negative and it can hurt us. And you can just, it can get to you any minute. You just never know, you know, and um, that that is a very unconscious thing that many of us hold about our vulnerability. And I think that that is what has allowed that to precipitate out into this kind of um, spreading thing, yeah. you know? So, um, but it's also a global consciousness, which is amazing. And I think as soon as we all learn more about um, presence in our own selves and that nothing can really affect us unless we let it, that we don't, we're not at the um, effect of some outside world because it's all me at some higher level. In other words, there's no line around me mm -hmm. and then the world's out there. If you go in and meditate, you just go out, 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 and it's all continuous. And that's all you. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? <laughs> yes, kind of... it does. Um, so for me, changing my thoughts from the outside in, let's say, uh, between I'm a victim of what happens to me to uh, I actually create what's happening for me was really, you know, it's really the, the core of my understanding or the, the my parallel shifting Right. shifting my paradigm. Right. So how do we inspire people to continue thinking that way and realizing this without, like you said, necessarily triggering fears that make them go into like denial uh, rather than yeah. using this knowledge? Well, I think we wake up on a certain schedule <laughs> that we've set <laughs> for ourselves um, and we backslide and then we get another experience that Oh yeah, that's right. This it was it's supposed to be this way, not that way. And we, we, you know, teach ourselves gradually, but um, I think maybe the key thing is in the beginning is that you say like, it's about attitude. I can choose my attitude about anything. You know, I can choose to see it as something that I am helping show myself or everyone is helping show me because it's exactly what I need. Mm -hmm. And so it's all loving and it all makes sense. And so let me look and see why this is here. And yeah. at that point, you know, uh, you learn. And the more you learn to trust, the, the easier it gets. And the more it comes up and the bigger the things come up, uh, it, you never would have handled them, you know, two months ago, but now you're stronger and more loving. And of course, it's no, no problem. Um, and you clear yourself that way. Yeah. But I think a lot of it, it, it comes with first the idea that 
I don't, I don't need to blame anybody, the outside world, other people, situations, you know, a car accident made me do this. Uh, no, I can choose how I respond to these things. And, and then I can choose to go into everything and see why mm -hmm. and find the deeper truth and clear it. Yeah. Now, sometimes that will um, create a healing or if you're, you're paralyzed or something and it's like a sort of non-reversible thing, then you just become this glowing light that teaches other people about life or something, you know, yeah. it, you don't let it make you into a, into a victim. And victim. Yeah. Yeah. It takes a lot of courage. Right. Well, you know, courage, eventually it becomes more like, I don't really realize why I live to need to live my life in pain and suffering. Yeah. It's not comfortable. <laughs> yeah. So I don't want to do it. <laughs> yeah. And we've been so like, so somewhat conditioned to suffer so that we can, uh, give ourselves permission to have the reward that right. we always wanted. Right, right. And get can't, attention for it. Yeah, we can't just get, you know, whatever we want to get just because, you know, there has to be a suffering reason. For <laughs> right. Our, right. Yeah, it's funny. Yeah. <laughs> right. So like I just mentioned, we've all been conditioned and so have I and I have my own framework for existence. But, you know, I believe it's super important to me not to be attached to my definitions and my beliefs and to change them if they, you know, if they don't work for me anymore and yeah. if it suits me to change them. So along the same lines and transparency also, you mentioned a quote by Esther Hicks that says, belief is nothing more than a chronic thought pattern. <laughs> so what would be good tips and tricks that we could give people to give them the permission to change their thought patterns that no longer serves them or the dogmas that they're holding on to or. Right. Yeah. I think it's a very good habit to, to start questioning things or to have curiosity about things. Yeah. So um, where did I get this belief system? <laughs> Whose was it? Uh, what good does it do me? Uh, maybe there's another way. Maybe there's something more comprehensive that is more interesting uh, that will work better for me. Because I don't, there's nothing wrong with having like a belief, but don't lock it down forever. Because exactly. it's, our consciousness evolves beyond one explanation is fine for a while. And then you go, oh, there's more variables to this. Oh, let me expand my worldview. Yeah. You know, oh, well, I don't really need rules anymore because I get a sense now of um, how to act ethically or unselfishly or to allow my own personal creativity to blossom. Yeah. Right. There's all kinds of things. Right. Um, but I think questioning and exploring and being open to um, new ideas coming in and not necessarily replacing something, but merging with the old. And then it changes it like, you know, you add a spice to a soup, you know, and it changes it. Um, every, nothing it really goes away. It's always like morphs <laughs> along. Yeah. Yeah. Like you said before, it's all for our evolutionary growth and it's all there to make us like evolve into, into more. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's our drive. That's our core drive. Yeah. You know, who's doing it to us? No, we're, we want to grow, you know, this is it. And as soon as we hear something that clicks and everybody has their own level of the click, <laughs> right? Um, right. Then we go, Oh, this is better. I like this. You know, yeah. just like people say, I need a new car, you know, because my old car is old. Well, you're ready for a new vehicle, you know, a new way of moving in the world, whatever, but you get new new beliefs the same way. But I think the big problem is the left brain always likes to lock it down and make it a rule and keep it preserved forever, you know, and this is the way it is, except there's more. <laughs> Except the seasons change and That's right. the world goes round. And mm. in, so our yeah. <laughs> in our last conversation, you talked about writing about McCarthyism and going into that reality bubble. 
Yeah. And I read, I didn't know what McCarthyism was. So I read up a little bit about on it and it was compared to the witch trials back in the late 1600s and how right. like people were being persecuted without proof. Mm -hmm. So in changing my paradigm, in changing my worldview from the outside in, it brought about a lot of crit criticism from others. And which in turn, what it did for me is it created a lot of self-doubt, right? Because you know, oh. the energetic world is not as tangible as the real What world. sort of criticism, for example, oh, did, did uh, they, people say to you? That's a good question. Uh, that you're crazy or you're not being yeah, real being or grounded? Yeah, being idealistic. Or... I'm not, you know, I'm not facing the real world and I'm just, uh, it's magical thinking. And yes, it's yes. It's just, you know, mm -hmm. it's not real and it's, how are you going to make money doing that, you know? <laughs> How, how are you going to make money being crazy and things yeah. like that? You know? yeah. So, and then it created a lot of self doubt in me. And so how mm -hmm. can, uh, to bring it back to like McCarthyism and like going into that reality right. bubble, how can we shift into a different reality bubble? How can it help us like manage righteous indignation or, you know, criticism and, and strong attachments to, to, religious beliefs or dogmas or things. Like yeah, that. well, I think anybody on a spiritual path encounters some level of this, when yeah. you start to work with the non physical reality, all the people who are really in the physical reality, will actually get scared mm -hmm. that you're challenging their view of their nice, comfortable, strongly defined thing about how life works and what's good and bad and everything. And um, I don't know. The way I've handled it is um, have different ways of communicating to different people. You know, in some ways I used to practice like explaining things to a five-year-old. Like what would I say <laughs> to explain like higher universal law to somebody who's just getting going? To be humble about different levels of um, comprehension. Yeah. And, and, and you don't have to tell everybody everything yeah. either. So there's there's that. Um, and there's compassion for where people are. And they'll pretty much tell you where they are. Um, and so I think a lot of the solution for that is communication with, with the people. And if they don't get it, um, then you know they won't want to be around you, and you won't really want to be around them, and your 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 energies won't <laughs> materialize together anymore unless yeah. you engage in that opposition and want to prove yourself or have that one upsmanship. Yeah, you know, um, and uh, I mean I've had had conversations with very fundamentalist Christians and about the, the way that we all had similar values that came from the teaching, the original teachings about truth and the universe, the golden rule and all that. Oh, but no, you have, you know, and they would tell me how it wasn't the same. Yeah. Uh, and so I just, okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, but I think, you know, when you're hitting on a truth that is really just right for you, and it starts to, you know, like I said, those clicks, like things start to line up, the puzzle pieces come together, you know, and create an alignment. And it feels better and better when you have an explanation that is less limiting, you know what I mean? It allows you more freedom and trust. And anytime you go into states like that, your heart opens. Yeah. And boy, it changes you, you know? So... Yeah. I don't know if that answers that, but I mean, the, the I thing of it... going into lack of self-confidence over that is that's all, all the left brain. And it's kind of a yeah. something you learn to recognize the feeling state when you start to go into that contraction. And then you go, wait, that's old. I don't want to do that particularly anymore. I'm just going to come back to the present moment and just be the way I like to be. Yeah. And I, I think, I think bottom, the bottom line also is, is that you're worthy of feeling good. You know, you're allowed <laughs> right. to feel good. Right. You don't have to feel bad to try to get something good. You know, it's kind of <laughs> right. like we've been thought. Right. Yeah. yeah. So it's like, um, 
uh, a sacrifice is very outmoded. Yeah. It's not, it doesn't work anymore. It's one of those old ideas. And the fact is, if you tune into the collective consciousness of all the souls and how interconnected we all are, that everybody wants me to get the ideas that are just right for me. So it's win-win for me, but ones that I will then give back out to other people. So they get to have the next thing they need and it flows. And, you know, same thing. I give them that and then they get their next idea and give the world back a new invention or whatever it is. It's all interconnected. So I don't do it all alone. And I'm not at the effect of everybody else telling me what to do because we're in it together. And it's always whatever you notice that feels just right and almost kind of like I always call it spring fever, you know, that feeling of like, ooh, you know, um, (laughs) that that is your soul stuff. That's the thing that everybody wants you to take up and go ahead with and and further and create and then give. So a lot of people have things that they've created and done but they're afraid to give it to the world yeah you yeah know, that they don't feel it's worthy but go ahead put it out figure out how to get it to, to people or how to to uh communicate about it that's yeah. just marketing um you know but you've got to offer things yeah and to remember also that although we don't see the energetic world where we're starting to see it more and more Mm. but we are still affecting the field and people can feel that and so to trust in that and oh people read each other immediately yeah when you get near a new person you're it's like just scanning you know (laughs) we're not (laughs) <laughs> really aware of how we do it but you know oh that one's trustworthy that one I don't like they're too tight or something <laughs> and um, I, I'm not going to enjoy being around them uh, or or I'm going to learn something from that person because I think they know mo- a little more than I do about this or you see actually almost get like telepathic pictures in your head about um, what somebody has done in their past, you know, like, oh, ballerina or something. And, and you just start to kind of get that now. It's, it's um, part of Amazing. becoming ultra sensitive, but yeah. we're also telepathic and clairvoyant in a certain way. And, you know, it's really fun. Yeah. So I'm going to go back to like my third question. I, I passed over it because we were in, in another <laughs> reality bubble, but now you just mentioned and in your, okay, so in your last conversation, you mentioned uh, that back before you wrote Frequency, you were thinking about writing a book on empathy, right. but that your agent at the time said that people weren't ready for empathy. <laughs> right. So can you elaborate on what that means? And do you think people are ready for empathy today? Or Oh, yeah. Well, there are a number, like Judith Orloff's written a book on empathy. There, You know, it's coming out now. Okay. But I think then it was because my publisher had had published The Secret. Mm -hmm. And there were a lot of, um, you know, principles in that, but people were just using it to make money Mm -hmm. because they were in fear. Right. And so the whole idea about empathy was like, still like they didn't get it yet. You know, it wasn't, wasn't ready. Um, But I do think because of the acceleration of the energy on the planet that we're all becoming, I call it ultra sensitive, Mm -hmm. picking up on energy information. Right. And that can come in a number of different ways. Like we just said, telepathically or come through the senses or just as imprints impressions on your body. Like I got an imprint of something. Uh, but we have now we're having to learn how to decipher energy information and make it and realize that we're getting in that kind of information. And also to that we don't have to know everything in the field around us, just what we need to know. Mm-hmm. That there are some principles of how to work with empathy <laughs> at this point. But that's one of the common complaints I hear in when I do sessions for people is that I'm t- I'm just overwhelmed. There's too much, too much information, too many people, too much chaos. Um, And, you know, of course, COVID is helping that a lot. (laughs) Yeah. But, um, uh, yeah. But I think that we're, 
we're um, refining the kind of information that we're able to perceive, right? So a lot of the things that used to be supernatural or higher, higher psychic gifts are now kind of becoming a little more ordinary, a little more common. I mean, I know lots of people that are good healers now, like they just opened up and let themselves do this thing and they have, have abilities. You know, a lot of people are opening up in various ways. Absolutely. And yeah, mm. and which brings me quite perfectly to my next question. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Um, so changing my thoughts from the outside in has awakened me to my multi-dimensionality. So here I'm not talking about, you know, the fact that I'm a woman, a mother, I'm idealistic, yeah. or I live in Canada and so on, but more, you know, about the fact that I can channel information from other beings, let's say mm -hmm. angels or column elementals right. or even extraterrestrials. Um, and you mentioned in your last, in our last conversation that when you start to maybe write a book or write an essay or something that you call in the writers like to help right. you. So yeah, so we've, you know, we've talked about like, we've labeled this kind of stuff like paranormal, which is actually, I think, just viewing stuff from a different point of view. But mm -hmm. um, can you talk about those effects on, uh, on the, the, um, uh, the quickening of our consciousness or the, the world? I guess where my mind goes first with that is that um, as we tune into the non-physical dimensions, like multi-dimensions, there are many frequencies. I guess those are multi-dimensions as well. Yeah. Um, that we start to understand more and more about the imaginal realm, which is the that part of the of the consciousness where all realities exist. You know, it's like in physics they call it the many worlds theory. You know, and as soon as you place attention on one, it comes out of the background and, and comes to you. Attention is this mutually attractive thing, right? And whatever you place attention on, it's like the world collapses into that reality. If you take your attention out of it, it goes back on the shelf, mm -hmm. you know? And um, so there's this, this kind of sense that um, pretty much unlimited creativity for one thing, but the imaginal realm then becomes this really fun place to be. And of course, when you're dreaming at night, you're in that those realms of consciousness, uh, which, you know, you go through the energy realm, the emotional realms, the, the mental realms, the higher spiritual causal pl planes, the Akashic records, and, you know, it goes out so that all knowledge is out there, you know, and, um, uh, and, and you get so that it's really available to you. And your curiosity is like the zoom lens that focuses you into any part of it. There's no rules. You can do what you like. You can combine variables and have any kind of reality that would be the, you know, the result of those variables. Mm -hmm. Or take one variable out and put a different one in and it would change. You know, it's fun. Yeah. And creativity is a blast. <laughs> You know, so why would we just want to resign ourselves to one limited reality and live that for our entire life? I, I, I mean, once you start playing with creativity, you know, it's great. Well, it's pretty fun. Yeah. You know, so when I call in, I call it the writers from the sky, you know, um, I just think of all the, the communicators, all the great writers and help me write this. Let's all do this together. And it's in my mind that I am with them. They're not out there anymore. They're right here. And we are um, feeling and sensing and, and then the, an idea and insight will pop in and I go, oh, I could put that in there, you know, and, and it's like guidance. Co-creating. Yes, it's a definite co-creation. That's beautiful. And it, I love it. It's like, it's not work, you know. So you can, I think if you use the imaginal realm, nothing has to be work. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And I don't know if this relates, but I had listened to a previous interview when I, when I, when I, when I was trying to find it, I didn't find it again to, to, to ask my next, next question. So I'm not sure if I'm on topic or not, but 
in the other interview, you talked about something about being in the same space, but not being in the same time or being in the same time, but not right. being able to be in the right. same space. Right. So can I think you I might have been, that? Yeah. yeah, I might have been talking about past lives. Okay. Because what I've, but, I've sensed about it is like, and parallel lives, because I think right. we also have other parts of our soul that have incarnated into different kinds of personality structures. Um, and so like when you have, like I have a couple of past lives that overlapped by just a few years, but what's interesting about them when I researched them and found out, they both had connections to the same cities and they both moved around among those cities, but never at the same time. So they never met each other or ran into each other. So they were in the same time, but in different spaces. You know, now if you have parallel lives, um, it's kind of the same thing, I suppose. Um, but generally past lives, they're in different times, but they could be in the same space. Does that make sense? You know, like yeah. if mine hadn't overlapped, they would have been separated in, in time. In time but they would have shared space. They would have had the same space. And, and this is just coming to me now. Like, do you think deja vus are different times crossing the same space? No, uh, my experience of deja vu is that during uh, dreams, we expand our bubble out from the physical world and we forget that we're physical and we remember that we're non-physical and we fly around and we do, we go through all these zones uh, changing our frequency and everything. But we often go out to the causal plane, which is where the life purpose exists and things are kind of engineered so that you will meet up with the people you need to meet up with to get the lessons you need or give the things you need. And it's all like a, a rehearsal or something. And often you'll, you'll go up there and maybe there'll be five tracks you could go down in order to get the same thing to happen and you try them all out. And then when you come back into time and space and your physical reality, at some point, one of those tracks has been, you've selected and it's, it's happening. And then you go, wait, I already did this. And it's almost always a very mundane thing, you know, like, oh, I walked in that door and I saw that plant. And then this man said this and off you go, and, and I've been here before. But I think it is a memory of that higher uh, blueprint that you were playing with in order to decide how the physical would unfold. Groovy. Groovy, yeah. <laughs> um, I strongly believe, and I've been told, that extraterrestrials haven't landed on earth yet because we're still immature energetically <laughs> what's your take on that <laughs> well i think there are different kinds of extraterrestrials yeah. and i like to talk about intergalactic beings oh, because beautiful. i think there are different levels um the ones i work with i call intergalactic because they do they are not physical but they come into my dream world or sometimes um, a sort of a parallel, slightly off vibe of the physical. And uh, they often are resetting me, you know, like I'm getting a no new set of instructions or I'm getting tw tweaked <laughs> or something. Yeah. Uh, and they're like, they're watching over and, and then helping. But it's rare. It's like they're not always there. They're there when you need to get um, adjusted, sort of, you know. An upgrade. I, an upgrade, yeah. And um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I've so they're very tall. The ones I see, they don't really have faces, but they, they have real, like seven, eight feet tall, made, mainly kind of white energy, whitish energy. Um, but then, of course, you have the little gray beings, the little guys, and I think they have landed on Earth you know, in and out, but not too much in ways that people, not everyone sees them. Right. I think it's very possible those beings can, through telepathy, be seen or not seen, right? It's like 
Obi-Wan Kenobi, you do not see the droids. There are no droids, you know, like that. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Um, well, that's why they say that Bigfoot, like we, we can't right. see them or because so, they go into right. a different parallel reality or right. different dimensions right. where we can't mm -hmm. see them anymore. Yeah. 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 So I think that's really possible. But I think there are a lot of other beings in the universe with us and they are at different frequencies. You know, and, and angelic beings, for instance, you know, I don't think they ever become physical. They are a connecting link. But I think there might be other categories of beings who come in and take form as sort of temporary guides or something. Uh, but angelic force and especially archangels to me, they, they don't ever take shape, but they are huge energies. So I, I talk about angelic force rather than individual angels sometimes more mm -hmm. that it's, I feel it can share space with you. You can open your body up and get really quiet and invite them in and they'll sit inside you and they'll be with you. They don't exert influence. They don't try to change you. They just hold a frequency that you can match. Yeah. And it's so peaceful. Yeah. It's one of the great meditations actually. Um, uh, but I think that, you know, in the old days, like, um, I was just reading something about the Essenes, you know, that were one of the sects in, in Israel way back when they held it sacred to know all the names of the angels. And they were, when I thought about it, I could feel it almost that it was like, um, mantras mm -hmm. that if you, it's like bells ringing almost, um, when you recite the name of the angels, it sounds like a bell and it, it's an alignment, like a sound attunement. Um, and so, you know, there are, <laughs> there are a lot of things that we do to stabilize our frequency or raise our, our frequency that have been around for lots of different disciplines. Yeah. I've also, and this will be my last question um, because talking to you goes by so fast I'm having such a great time <laughs> um, I've read also that uh, most advanced uh, extraterrestrial races but uh, the physical ones operate on synchronicity and one of the ways that we can increase our awareness is by living by the principle of synchronicity so what does synchronicity mean to you and how how could we live and operate out of more synchronous synchronicity well i think it has something to do with experiencing three-dimensional time and space where at the lower frequencies it, everything feels separated and you're isolated and in order to get to your goal you have to go through empty space and have tasks and it slows everything down. The higher your frequency get, the more you have immediate results to a thought. And then you get these like synchronicity things and says, Oh, look, <laughs> you know, I just thought about that. And now it's happening. <laughs> like we're, we're sort of showing ourselves that, Oh, this is a new way that things are functioning. You know, plus we're sort of entertaining ourselves with it. <laughs> and, um, and so a higher functioning is that you start to get used to the way um, the present moment works when all things are connected and everything knows about everything else. So when I work with like uh, my dead mother or father, I think of them, I get quiet, I think of them, and then I realize they're thinking of me. Or did they think of me first and then I thought of them or did, no, we thought of each other exactly at the same, the same moment. Time. So if you think of them, they are thinking of you. You know, it's like, there's no separation that way. And I think that's what you mean by the higher beings working with synchronicity. They just get it that whatever they bring into and focus on as a thought and they transmit telepathically into the minds of whoever, that's the way the reality will materialize. You know, or that's the, they'll time travel through aligning the mind with 
a certain cross hair, you know? Yeah. I had a dream once where I was um, part of a crew on a spaceship and we were, it was a saucer type sh- round thing. And we were all standing in a circle and all had on those silver suits that you see sometimes. They were made out of a uh, crystalline metallic kind of substance that was very, very thin. And then the hull, the ship itself was also made out of this substance. Yep. And we had to connect with each other and align our minds and energy fields exactly and create and then we had to lift our energy up together without one person doubting because if you did it would explode or something you know like we all had to be exactly in the same frequency and we had to go to the next level at the same time and somehow that took the ship out of time and space yep and we just disappeared Uh, and there was something about and then I was thinking actually this morning of this dream of, and it was a long time ago, um, that there was something about that crystalline metallic thing that was responsive to energy. And that when we created that consciousness level, we created an energy level that just took everything uh, into a non-physical level and we, we left the physical world. Um, but I remember that feeling of, oh boy, if you even doubt it for a millisecond, you're like screwing up the rest of your group. You know, you can't do that. Yeah, it was real interesting. That's amazing. Um, That's amazing. It, it makes it sense on how interconnected we all actually are. Yeah. And how we affect each other. Absolutely. You know? And uh, I'm, a big, uh, I'm a big fan also of Bashar. I don't know if you've uh-huh. uh, yeah. you know, channeled by Daryl Anka. And yeah, he's been around a long time. Yeah. Yeah. And um, he talks about like the material that you're talking about, like the sort of polymer that you're talking about. And that's, you know, that's what they wear. And that's mm-hmm. what their ships are okay. made of. And the mm-hmm. ships are actually, um, I don't know if I'm explaining this correctly, but, you know, um, the location of something is actually not somewhere in space, but it's a component of what it is. And so when you, they use consciousness to travel the universe because (laughs) it goes, it's faster than the speed of light. And if you, you know, just lock on to the location and, you know, pick it up and take it out and put it in another location while you disappear from one place and you reappear in another place. And I, so ships are connected consciously with that's right well you know the speed of light is still linear it's still in that slower reality yeah uh, but i had another dream where i was a navigator on a ship nice. uh, and again it was like a big console and a lot of people were sitting around and my job was um to get it was doing time travel like that and we had to go back to the place where we had started and i said well we have to go back through seven now moments <laughs> I, I said said that out loud to myself. Oh, yes. And it's like, okay, the focus, the focus, the focus, the, you know, and, and that was like frequencies or something, you know, yeah. and made sense to me totally at the time. <laughs> oh, wow. That's amazing. <laughs> amazing. Yeah. So I know we do all that stuff, you know, in our higher realms in our dreams whatever when we lose lose our consciousness of the body for a little while and go out and and explore and have fun and do all that in yeah. that realm yeah 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 and i and that realm will one day will become this realm and they'll, they'll right merge right i mean that that means that the rules of the way matter functions will copy then the the way spirit functions and they will be malleable and it will be identical almost but just at a slightly lower lower vibration yeah yeah and that's what i think is actually happening now that's why we can see spirit is in matter now we're starting to see through matter (laughs) do you know it's not like the big barrier it's not opaque anymore that's why i wrote transparency yeah that's happening yeah you know so many wonderful things to look forward to yeah 
Yeah. yeah. And to play with right now, even, you know, to like go into right now, because yeah. we all know a lot about this stuff. We're just pretending we don't. Yeah. Or we're not saying it out loud because we're scared. That we're <laughs> shunned or That's right. 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 Burnt right. at the stake for no yeah. reason. Yeah. So. <laughs> Thank you so much, Penny, for you are the welcome. second very, very good conversation. It's always fun. We get into some good stuff. Yeah, yeah. So have yourself a great day. Thank you. And, Thank uh, you. You too. We'll talk again soon. Thanks. All right. I look forward to it. All right, cool. All right. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.